the last 16 months, we've all dealt with unprecedented headwinds. And I know for myself, when I'm in moments like this, personally and professionally, sometimes you have to stop and look at the work you're doing and ask yourself, do I need to pivot? It's for that reason I wanted to speak with Alyssa Rapp. Alyssa is the founder and CEO of Bottlenotes Inc. and currently the CEO of Surgical Solutions. She's an adjunct professor in entrepreneurship at Booth and the author of Leadership and Life Hacks. Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us. John Paul, it's a pleasure to be here and I really appreciate the invitation. So I was hoping you would take us back to 2005 when you founded Bottlenotes and give us a sense of the original mission of this company that you put together right after you had finished Stanford Business School. Right out of Stanford, I was uh, expecting to be an entrepreneur. I can't say I expected to be an entrepreneur in the e-commerce wine space. I had come from a real estate family and, and health and fitness uh, family, having created the East Bank Club. My stepfather created the East Bank Club in downtown Chicago, the largest one-stop shop fitness center in the country still. And I thought I'd build East Banks on the West Coast. And when I decided that there were imperfect substitutes, but ample substitutes on the West Coast, and yet there was this new burgeoning passion of mine in wine, it would be something fun to look at. Uh, but then through a supply chain management class, I ended up discovering a really interesting back-end logistics firm called New Vine Logistics that I later wrote a case on at Stanford Business School that was doing innovative things to enable the shipment, legal shipment and supply chain management of wine to all 50 states. And there was an opportunity for that firm that was then doing those activities primarily for wineries to do that on behalf of, say, a quote, third-party marketing firm. Uh, the likes of Amazon.com at the time. And I said, what if I, instead of having to invest in product and in, invest in any backend logistics, just raise some seed capital or what we'd now call Series Seed, Series A, and build a tool online that helped match supply and demand, helped take the next generation wine enthusiasts that I was living with day to day as a Stanford Business School student and seeing in action as a co-chair of the Stanford GSB Wine Circle. What if the way that that Gen X consumer was learning about wine through peer recommendations and through, the, and through knowing what they liked and tasted and could remember it again, very different from the previous generations who in fact read the wine spectator or just looked at scores, et cetera. What if we could help educate and entertain that next generation wine enthusiast about their preferences in wine and just deliver them those boutique and estate wines from around the world tailored to their personal tastes and then help that long tail of supply, those boutique and estate producers and importers get access to that next generation consumer. And in the best case scenario, do that on a subscription basis where we were delivering two to 12 bottles of wine per month or every quarter uh, to those consumers in, in most of the 50 states tailored to their personal taste at varying budget sensitivities. So that was the original thesis. Think of it as the original Netflix for wine. And I think what I learned the hard way, by the way, looking back, one of the many lessons learned from the bottle notes era was being too early to a market is sounds glamorous, but ending up being friends to Facebook or in our case, a decade and change too soon to that market, really, really hard. Uh, and market timing being one of the many things that is nothing you can never perfectly time, but can really have an outsized impact on your ultimate success or failure. And yet it seems like notwithstanding these challenges, pre-2008, you had some wonderful successes. Oh, thank you, Jean-Paul. We did. You know, what we did first and foremost was do something innovative, giving consumers what they wanted, demystifying wine, making it accessible, leveraging patent pending matching technologies to ask you questions like, how do you take your coffee and tea? How much do you salt your food? Things that are easy to answer to intimate people's bitterness sensitivity that helped us give a um, a taste map of what their likes and dislikes were, and then the joy and fun of connecting with those boutique and estate wineries from around the world who were willing to take a chance on a cutting edge technology concept and liked the idea of getting access to that next generation consumer. Those things worked. We amassed, you know, we amassed literally early low thousands of wine club members, which is pretty sexy when the LTV lifetime value was in the you know, $800 to $2,000 per subscriber, depending on at what economic level they subscribe. We took, uh, listened to our customers well. Uh, the bottle notes name came into play because we also wanted to help people keep automatically store what they had tried and liked through us and have that online notes journal or database where they could continue to remember and archive what they tried and liked as a hopping off point for other things they might try in restaurants or anywhere else or buy at a physical retail shop. We had some of our early subscribers love us so much that they said, oh, we're getting married. Could you please help us create a starter seller? So we ended up having that idea of an online storage of your notes 
Mary with this idea of personal curation. And we built the Bottle Notes Wine Registry, the first in the nation and beat out wine.com and others for an exclusive partnership with weddingchannel.com. So we did a lot right. Uh, and I think that, you know, had the regulatory winds not changed, we could have been one of those early major players in the e-commerce world as third-party marketing, third marketing firms go. You already mentioned one of the two headwinds you faced in 2008, and I was hoping you could describe both of them and the challenges they presented to this young company that had already enjoyed some real successes. They did. And the first one, the, the, the most material headwind was that there was this regulatory sea change that I, I alluded to earlier. And the Amazon.com uh, wine team, Jeff Bezos purportedly thought that wine could be a multi-billion dollar division as big as books early in, in Amazon's tenure and life cycle. And I still believe that's true, by the way. Uh, and what happened was, is that when Amazon got quite serious about entering the market uh, to direct to consumer market on a, for the second time in their life cycle, the first time being when they invested originally in wineshopper.com. And the second time now they were going to be directly investing in new vine logistics to launch Amazon wines as a third party marketing firm. The distributors uh, throughout the country were very, very, very concerned that it was a fixed buy, which it's not, and that if Amazon entered, it would kill their market share, which it wouldn't have. More consumers buying wine direct to consumer educates them on what their preferences are, and the number one thing a consumer will buy is what they've tried and liked before. So ostensibly, Amazon would have been helping to grow the whole pie, uh, and, and so will. But in that moment, the, the distributor's regulatory power was tremendous and still is. And so through um, political pressure, they got the California Alcohol Bureau of Control to issue an industry advisory calling into question and putting wineries licenses at risks, I might add, if they chose to work with third party marketing firms. And that came out and that was intended to keep Amazon out of the market or at bay for quite some time. That was the political motivation. They didn't have they didn't have their eye on taking us out, but in the end we were taken out because how could we as a third party marketer think of it as a matching service where we only made money when wineries chose to transact with us to consumers we had brought to the table as an agent of the consumer. Well, when Amazon was getting chased out, we ended up having to shut down as an e-commerce player ourselves or put our wineries licenses at risk, which is by no means a uh, sustainable business model. So that was the put up the white flag, pivot versus quit, as you as you mentioned early in, in today's conversation. Help us to better understand this regulatory headwind you were facing. I know that the regulatory structure around wine and spirits is hopelessly complex, but what exactly changed at that period in time that made you think this business mission you had been on for three years might actually turn out to be untenable? So, you know, this regulatory change that we were facing was, uh, very simply put, the California Alcohol Bureau of Control was, after nine years of having approved this idea of third-party marketing firms existing in the U.S. wine industry and allowing and, uh, consumers to buy wine in most of the states through the legal channels and the legal process that's set up by the 21st Amendment, they started to question that because of the political pressure they were getting from distributors. And once they called into question the ability for third-party marketing firms like BottleNotes.com or Amazon.com to enter the marketplace and threaten to fine wineries and importers that work with people like us and players like us, all of a sudden the market came to a great standstill. And our ability to operate no longer existed because we would we would then be putting our partners' licenses at risks, and therefore we had to make a choice to pivot or quit our original business model. Were we going to become um, a different type of BottleNotes.com, and we pivoted, as you know now, to a media company, or we were just going to shut down our doors because what we did originally, helping consumers get access to wine and actually shipping them that wine, was something we no longer were going to be legally able to do. So tell us a little bit more about that. Here you are, this young entrepreneur, you've raised a lot of money, and in three years, you've enjoyed some real successes. Put us into your shoes. You face these headwinds. How precisely did you think through this particular moment and how you might get through it? Really hard, John Paul. It was really hard. I mean, there were a lot of moments where you're looking at the mirror, staring at yourself, saying, you know, do I have what it takes to pivot this thing? Because because staying on the course was just jumping off the cliff. That that was no longer viable. The question is, what do we do with it? Do we sell this technology, put up the white flag and move on? And I had investors, seed stage investors who were amazing. And they said, you did nothing wrong here. This is an exogenous factor. You've killed it. We'll back you again, just move on. And, and I seriously thought about it. I'm not gonna lie to you, it was, it was tempting. On the other hand, I knew we were creating value in the ecosystem and I knew we were creating 
value in specifically that way of helping educate and entertain the next generation enthusiasts and helping brands get access to that next generation enthusiasts. So by conversations, particularly with one of my mentors and close friends, Marissa Mayer um, of technology, Silicon Valley fame, you know, one time we were talking about this and, and I said, I know we're adding value here and I've thought about inverting the model, but I'm, I'm trepidatious. And she said, you know, why not go for it? And if you instead really do think of yourself as that inverted model where instead of making money when consumers choose to transact with you on a subscription basis for this boutique uh, long tail of supply exclusively, what if instead you think of yourself as a platform on which consumers can get educated and are entertained by wine and brands will then pay you for access to that audience and things like your newsletter and large scale events that were formerly cost centers become profit centers and the business model. And then and any sales generated and all sales generated then are then owned by the brands themselves like in any traditional digital advertising concept. And, and you know, it was her encouragement and many other people's uh, that ultimately said to me, let's do this thing and let's pivot this strategy. Let's keep adding value in the ecosystem. And, you know, as time marched on and national partnerships with the likes of media greats such as Condé Nast were forged, it certainly became um, clear that that strategy had, and that pivot had paid off, but it wasn't quite that easy. It wasn't you face this massive regulatory hurdle, you have an idea and a strategy, and then you uh, and you decide to go for it. There were there was the other uh, headwind you uh, mentioned previously, which was, was also 2008, and the greatest economic meltdown that I had thus seen in my lifetime. So it was uh, not the easiest time to pivot strategies and kind of do a restart to the startup. So what you're describing here is really a, a fundamental change from the original vision of your company. And I'm curious, how did you explain the need for this change to the people you work with, the people who put their faith in you? And how did you describe to them what needed to be done so that bottle notes could continue? You know, first of all, I had to get comfortable and clear and have the conviction myself that it was the right thing to do because you can't sell something you don't believe in. Or certainly I can't as a founder of companies. And so I ended up having conversations with advisors and directors and investors. And, and then, of course, my co-founder uh, at the time, Kim Donaldson. And we got clear that it was something we believed in it would make sense. So, and then in order of priority, we knew we needed to find, refresh the capital base and bring in media investors, probably New York media investors, which we ultimately did, um, to run at that new strategy. Because again, it was really a restart. I also didn't want to completely, you know, wipe out the early capital investors because there was some value they had created in terms of the brand and the audience and the, and the platforms that we were going to be leveraging because the thought was also, you know, shut it down, start anew. Didn't want to do that either. Wanted to honor and fight for the people who had been good to us early on as those series seed and series A investors. So we ended up getting conviction about the strategy, brought in a new independent director with co digital content generation experience and recent success, Heather, uh, who was amazing. I Heather Stevenson, she had been the co-founder of Ideal Byte, which had sold to Disney and was awesome. And then we also um, brought in new investors over time, but you asked the question about the team. You know, my, in, in, in the book, Leadership Life Hacks, I, describe this as sort of a St. Crispin's Day moment. But when I realized this is what we were going to have to do in that fall of 18 and brought everyone into the room with light blue walls and built-in bookshelves, not dissimilar from my home office and but much bigger and a little bit more bright, I, I, I looked at everyone and I said the truth, which is, listen, this regulatory headwind has hit us. It's, it hadn't hit us at that point. We knew it was going to be coming down the pike in the next three to four months. Our business model will be temporarily, permanent, temporarily, if not permanently, but temporarily obsolete. We have two choices to pivot versus quit. And I believe that we can tack the boat and sail towards this new island and horizon of being in uh, the leading next-gen interactive media company in Alcohol Bev and starting in wine. But if we do that, I need everyone to to tighten their belt for three months. I need everyone to be willing and able to go down to minimum wage. I will bring enough, we will have just enough capital to fight through it to that point. And I'll personally put in anything in my, you know, checking account as needed to, to keep us going for that time. Cause I'd already been a, a you know, meaningful investor in the company. But at the end of the day, I need time. I need 90 to 120 days to get this pivot or tacking of the, of the ship done. And in that time, I am gonna have too few, too few resources, too little water, too little food to get to both get us there and worried about if people are in or out. So if you can't do this, this is not what you signed up for. I completely understand. No harm, no foul. Take a day, think it through, and then let us know. 
If you can't, my Rolodex is your Rolodex and anything you need in order for us to go ahead and complete the pivot and you jump the ship, I get. But if you can hang with us, I promise we'll refresh your equity, pay you back the foregone wages with interest when we get the new capital raise done. And I think you'll have the opportunity to have been part of one of the great entrepreneurial stories of Silicon Valley. There are lots of stories like this, not just mine at Bottle Notes, whereby people have to do these pivots that are not that glamorous and not that often discussed, but it requires universally, universally requires the strength and conviction of people to, to join you in that, in that change. So we did successfully keep everyone except one woman who ended up starting her own graphic design firm, whom we, whom we later utilized as a, as a service provider to us. We had, uh, it was incredibly generous and gracious for those folks to, to, hang, to hang with us in making that change. We had to bring in new team members, such as a, new, a different type of CTO. We had to bring in an editor-in-chief and the wonderful and extraordinary Karen McNeil, the author of the Wine Bible, the most published book of all time. We had to, as I mentioned previously, new board, new independent directors, and then of course, new capital partners who had media investing experience, venture investing experience out of, out of Manhattan. And so the most satisfying day to me for that company, honestly, one of the most satisfying days of my entire career at Bottle Notes was the day that the money came in and we back paid the team for their foregone wages, far more satisfying than our largest advertising client or hitting certain user milestone metrics. It was that moment of seeing the look in my team's eyes that they knew that they had bet on themselves and they had made the right bet. That moment is when I knew that we had all together, not just me, not just us, we together had, had successfully pivoted. And that was satisfying. So I'm curious, insofar as we're talking about an experience that is now almost 13 years old, when you reflect on this time, is there a kind of central lesson that you took away from this experience, one that you maybe have applied in your continuing business endeavors, but also that you've tried to communicate in the classroom at places like Booth and Stanford, but also in your book, Leadership and Life Hacks? I think there are several lessons, but the central les lesson I have learned over and over and over again in my life, John Paul, is to keep swinging. This idea that until it's the ninth inning and the last out, to borrow one of my husband's great metaphors, you, it ain't over. And you will never... It, Nothing worthwhile is ever easy. Luck is by no means as gratifying as, as grit, but luck is luck and cannot be counted upon. Dedication, hard work, and fighting through challenge is the only thing you can control. You can control your effort and your attitude, and that is it. And that is necessary and not sufficient for success. I've been on the wrong side of market timing and too early. I've, through Surgical Solutions, sailed to a global strategic partner, been on the perfect side of timing when we got a transaction done four weeks before COVID. We did everything right. We worked our tails off. We had done set the stage for that moment. But if we had, if the timing had shifted six weeks, the entire deal might have been scuttled. So I have seen and learned the hard way that timing is outside of your control. Regulatory changes can be outside of your control. Your effort, your passion, your vision, and your commitment to excellence and to your team that, that you can't control and I believe is necessary and not sufficient in any, candidly, in any base of life. Well, of course, all of us have been dealing with forces far outside of our control for the last year and a half. And insofar as that's the case, this lesson in persistence that, to use another famous baseball maxim from the great Yogi Berra, that it ain't over until it's over, is one that is important indeed. And I'm so glad that you shared it. Alyssa Rapp, thank you so much for joining us. My great pleasure.